Good morning, everybody. And uh, for those of you that have asked and those that are wondering, I, yes, I did grow this last night, uh, this little bit of a beard here. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, uh, we will study, uh, we're kind of in the middle of the chapter there, uh, a few verses, starting at verse 16. I'll give you a moment to turn there, Mark chapter 1. We're working our way through this book at this time. Chapter 1, 16 to 20, which uh, is entitled, Jesus Calls the First Disciples. And uh, really, the, the big idea, before we read it here, the, the big idea is very, very simple. Um, if you have one of the handouts, you'll see that it's simply this, follow Jesus. That's the main thing that I want to communicate, that I want to encourage you in, to exhort you in, to invite you to, is to simply follow Jesus. If you're not following Jesus today, please start today. Uh, today can be the day that that journey begins, so please uh, consider that as we read this and uh, make a few comments on it. It says there, uh, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, that is Jesus, saw Simon, who would later be called Peter, same person, okay, Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately, Mark loves that word, immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately, there it is again, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. I think uh, one, of the, one of the greatest moments in the life of an uh, elementary-aged school child, at least I have this in my memory, I don't know if they do things the same in school anymore as they used to, but if you're uh, like a Gen Xer like me, you might remember being out on the, uh, the field or in the gymnasium and captains would be chosen and the captains would have to choose their teams for the, the game that was about to be played. And one of the greatest moments as a child uh, in that situation is to be called, to hear your name called, particularly if you were, you were chosen to be captain, although that wasn't uh, particularly inviting for everyone. Not everyone wanted to be in that position. Uh, but everyone wanted to be on a team. Everyone wanted to be chosen and called and, and to hear your name called, especially if you were early in the draft, you know. And no, nobody wants to be last, of course. Um, but if your name was called first or, or early, it's a, it's a great moment to hear your name. I'm, I'm being called. I'm, I'm going to be part of something now. I'm going to be part of this team. Or perhaps think of uh, a different stage of life in a different context, You know, when you're in the doctor's office and you've checked in and the the waiting room is jam-packed and it's busy and it's noisy and it's germ-filled and you just want to get out of there and the nurse or the the medical office assistant comes along and calls your name. That's a great moment, isn't it? Like, it's like, I want, I win. I get to go in and then I get to get out of here to be called by name. This, uh, This idea of being called call this word. We see it there in verse 20. It says, and immediately he called them. The word there in the original Greek is the word kaleo. Uh, And this word has a very, um, it's a purposeful word. There's intentionality behind it. There's, There's decisiveness with this word. And particularly when we read it in this context, you know, this is, not, this is not some sort of random broad invitation. This is not Jesus sort of, you know, strolling on the beach one day and he's got a clipboard and a pen and he's like, hey, uh, you know, anybody, I'm starting a thing over here and anybody want to sign up and join, join this thing? You know, that's, that's not what he's doing here. This word kaleo, call, it's, it's uh, often associated with being called by name. I think that's what Jesus is doing here. You know, he's not, again, he's, it's not just sort of a casting a, a net, as it were. He sees Simon. And he says, Simon, you, 
you and your brother, Andrew, you guys, come follow me. And then they go along and they see James and they John and he, James, John, you, you guys, come follow me. It's very specific. It's very direct. It's very purposeful. He calls them to himself, yes, and he calls them to this community. He calls them to a sense of belonging. Come join me. Be with me. Follow me. Literally walk behind me. Literally watch what I do and then eventually do what I do. Listen to what I say and then eventually say what I say. Join me and join this community that I'm forming. And so what I want to do with this passage is with this idea of call and then subsequently following Jesus, I want to just make three very simple observations. We won't be long this morning. Just three reflections, perhaps you could call them. Three contrasts, uh, three points, three-point sermon, of course. But the first one is simply that the extraordinary call to follow Jesus, because it is an extraordinary call, You know, this is a life changing. This is not, again, this is not Jesus saying, well, come try this out and see what you think. You know, does it feel good to you? You know, there's none of that. It's an extraordinary, life changing, life altering. Like he's calling these men to completely turn around the other way. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This idea of repent, right? Turn around. Turn away, think beyond what you're thinking now and come and follow me. It's an extraordinary call. This extraordinary call yet comes in the midst of very ordinary circumstances. So yes, the call of Jesus here is decisive, but it's not particularly dramatic in this case. You know, it, it's, uh, look at what they're doing. I mean, they're, Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, They were casting a net into the sea. Whoa, that's crazy, right? Why were they doing that? Well, because they were fishermen. They were just going about their business. They were just living everyday, ordinary life. It's not particularly dramatic. There's virtually no process. You know, Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, I I got a course that you need to take first, and then there's going to be a test at the end of the course, and we'll see if you know enough, and and, uh, we'll we'll test things out. You know, he, he picks these guys out with purpose, with intention. It's pretty non-dramatic, really, in many ways. Part of following Jesus, as we see in this scene here, means leaving behind the ordinary, leaving behind the mundane. Now, of course, we continue to live in mundane, ordinary, everyday life. I'm not suggesting that anybody, you know, quit your job and, and, and uh, you know, run off to some other place. Unless God calls you to do that, then do that, absolutely do that. Of course you should, you know, but, but there are things to be done in this life. That's, that's how I live my life. I don't know about you. I, my, my li- I describe my life as I do the things that need to be done. That's, that's what I do. There are things that need to be done, so I do them. And we live in this context. We live in this ordinary world, but on a, on a much higher level than the plain old day-to-day Jesus calls us to leave behind that ordinary way of thinking and believing, and he calls us into an extraordinary new life. But my point is simply is that, as one commentator says, is it is in their world that discipleship begins. Jesus comes to them. This is the whole thing about the incarnation. God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus comes to them. He comes to them, and he picks them out. He meets them right where they are in the midst of their ordinary circumstances. I love the, uh, the story of J.I. Packer's testimony. J.I. Packer was a, a famous uh, theologian, author. Um, we, uh, we did a, a series a number of years ago called Christians Every Christian Should Know, and I chose J.I. Packer as my uh, Christian that I think you should all know. Uh, brilliant man. Um, he passed away a few years ago, and his, his own personal testimony, so he grew up in England and grew up sort of nominally uh, Anglican, Church of England, Christian, you know, but he came to a point in his young adulthood where he started to realize, perhaps I'm not even a Christian. 
and he attended an, an evangelistic service one night, and uh, a gospel invitation was given, and uh, in that moment, he, he um, was given a picture in his mind. Now, that's a little bit more dramatic than, than uh, some situations, but he was given this picture in his mind of, of people in a, in a room or inside of a, a house or something, and they were engaged in, in playing a game, and they knew the game. They knew the name of it. They knew the rules. They knew how it worked. They knew how to, how to relate to each other. They were part of something. And he saw himself in his mind's eye as being outside of that. And he was looking in at it. And he realized in that moment, I need to come in. And just very simply, it says in one of his biographies, I became a Christian or something to that effect. Just, just not dramatic at all. Just, this is it. I'm going to follow Jesus now. Okay, cool. Let's go right? Well, think about your own life. Think about your own life now. What, what is happening? What are your circumstances right now? Reflect on that for just a moment. What, what is the, is, is your life pretty ordinary, pretty mundane, pretty boring, not, not much happening? Perhaps it's very dramatic at the moment. Perhaps it's entirely chaotic, you know, but whatever the circumstance, whatever is going on, ask yourself, Reflect on this later today and this week. How is Jesus' extraordinary call to follow him reaching your ears right now? How is God trying to get your attention? Maybe right now, even in this moment, Jesus is calling you to follow him today, starting right now. You realize you need to come in and you need to belong to him and to his people. It's an extraordinary call. That's the first reflection, the first contrast. The second one is that the call to follow Jesus is given with absolute clarity, yet it is also very mysterious. There's a lot of mystery to what he says here. There's a couple different things here. First of all, he calls them to himself. That much is straightforward, right? Right? Follow me, he says. He doesn't say, follow this new religious option, follow this set of rules, follow this particular lifestyle or way of dressing or any of that stuff. He the the call is to a person. The call is to the embodiment of the kingdom of God. The call is to the embodiment of the gospel, the good news itself. He calls them to himself. That is absolutely clear. Yet this is kind of unusual. So Jesus was known as a as a teacher, as a rabbi. And uh, in Jewish tradition, normally what would happen is the prospective student or students, they they would initiate. They would say, I want to follow this particular rabbi. Although the the call was not primarily to follow the particular rabbi, although I'm sure some were more attractive than others. You know, there's that whole popularity contest thing that goes on or whatever. But, um, But the call was primarily to follow God's law and to walk in his ways. But Jesus here does it the other way around. He he, he initiates and he makes it about himself. He says, Simon, Andrew, James, John, come follow me. It's it's very mysterious. It's very unusual. It's, It's clear on one hand, yes, but what is this? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth? Nazareth of all places. You know, what, what good could come out of Nazareth, one person said. Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? They didn't know this. They didn't know what this meant. They didn't know what the, the outcome would be. They didn't know how this was going to go. They didn't know the future. They didn't, who is this guy? What's he like? What's he going to say? What's he going to teach us? Where is he going to lead us? What's going to happen? Who knows? It's very mysterious. Clear call, yes, follow me. But what is that? Secondly, the, the mystery enhances when he says, follow me, and he says this, at least we know, to Simon and, and uh, Andrew. He says, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What? Like, clearly Jesus has never been fishing before, right? Because, like, I can just imagine Simon and Andrew going, fishers of men. Like, that's not how it works. Like, we're fishermen. We go in the water. We cast these nets and we bring up fish out of the water. You don't bring people, because that word men, by the way, anthropoi is a reference to people, not just male humans, but 
humankind, mankind, okay? You don't bring people up out of the water. This is not how this works, Jesus. Like, what are you, what are you saying? So right off the bat, Jesus is, is already on one hand clear, but on the other hand, like, think of the parables, right? I mean, the parables, everyone's sort of scratching their head, and it's like, well, if you have ears to hear, then you're going to get it. And it's like, what, do you, what is this, right? Very mysterious, yet also absolutely clear. Well, they would, of course, learn what that would mean. They would learn about Jesus. They would learn about his ways, and they would learn what it means to become fishers of men. But it wasn't entirely clear at first. For some reason, they trusted him, though. You know, I love the story of, and I, and I hesitate to tell these kinds of stories because you never know if they're actually true or not, right? And there's all these stories that go around and stuff. But I have read this in more than one place. It's the story of Mother Teresa. Uh, Mother Teresa, of course, who served in one of the worst slums in probably the world, uh, serving the sick and the dying for her whole life. And uh, someone went to visit her one time, and, and they saw her probably as a person who, who understood her mission in life. And I think, I think she did, you know, but, but the way they framed it was she must have clarity in her life. And so this person asked her, well, um, you know, m- mother, or perhaps she was sister at the time, would you pray for me for clarity in my life? And she said, no, I won't pray for clarity. Because clarity is, is the last thing you're holding on to that you need to let go of. Instead, I will pray for trust. I will pray that you trust God. She said about herself, I've never really had clarity in my life. I've had trust. I've trusted God all the way along. So apply this to yourself now. Again, think about your life. What what is going on? Is it mundane? Is it ordinary? Is it chaotic and dramatic? Whatever the case is, is perhaps an undue need for absolute clarity, preventing you from stepping out in faith and following Jesus. I love the story of, uh, you know, in Joshua 3, the scene is uh, the Israelites are going to cross the Jordan River. And uh, they know that that's the direction. That much is clear. How they're going to get across this river is very mysterious. They don't know how this is going to work. And the, the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they're standing there, and they're like, well, this isn't going to work, right? But, it, but when the, the priests stepped into the water, when they stepped out, when they had faith to step into that water, then God worked and he parted those waters and they went across to the other side. They trusted. It wasn't clear. Well, it was in one sense, but also very mysterious. You see, these, these, we often have to hold these things in tension, right? It's, it's often not this or that. It's often, yes, both of these things when it comes to the Bible and theology and all of this. All right, the third one. The third one is that the call to follow Jesus and the response for that matter happens in a moment particularly in in this scene and often in in many of our lives, it happens in a moment, but it also then lasts for a lifetime. It's not over in a moment. If the the call is genuine, you know, if if the seed falls on good soil, it lasts for a lifetime, eternity in fact. But look at the, in this moment here in this passage, look at the, the faith that's displayed here, the trust it's incredible, really. I mean, did they, again, did they know the risk? Did they know how this was going to play out? When Jesus came to Simon and Andrew and James and all these four men, did they, did they get it? Probably not, but they responded. They responded. They left what they were doing to follow him. Now, of course, as I said earlier, they would learn. And they would learn, as this one commentator says, that the process of becoming disciples of Jesus is a slow and painful one. How's that for an invitation today? Follow Jesus. It's going to be slow and painful and inefficient. Anybody want to sign up for that? Anybody want to join that? (laughs) They didn't know, but they would get to know Jesus as they followed him. And it's interesting how these four men, how their lives played out. 
after this moment. Um, each of them had quite an end on this earth. Uh, James, we know, was the first of the 12 to be martyred. You can read about that in Acts chapter 12. He was beheaded, killed by the sword by King Herod. Uh, John, his brother, uh, likely lived the longest of the 12, but certainly experienced persecution, certainly didn't have an easy life in that sense. Andrew, Andreas, my namesake, uh, who, uh, funny enough, I've actually written an entire paper on. Can you believe that I wrote a whole paper on Andrew? Like, there's not much there, but, but believe me, there's more than you think. Uh, Andrew, there's a, an early work that was... Uh, unfortunately disregarded by the early church fathers, but it's a work called The Acts of Andrew. And it does describe uh, Andrew's crucifixion at Patras, uh, reportedly preaching to the watching crowd for two days as he awaited death. And um, he was, it's said that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And you can see that if you go to St. Peter's uh, Basilica in Rome today, you can see there's a, a, an image of Andrew with the X-shaped cross. We see this X-shape on things like the, the flag of Scotland as well. It's, it's a common symbol today. And then Peter, Simon, uh, was believed to be crucified at Rome. It's said upside down because he uh, didn't want to be crucified in the same manner. He wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. So he asked to be crucified upside down. What, what, a, what a life, what a journey, what, what an adventure for these men. Everything changed in this moment when Jesus called them. And they lived these extraordinary lives and extraordinary ends. Now, into eternity, the call in their lives continues. The, the, the call to follow, to be with Jesus is now realized for them. So... Think of your own life now again. Where have you come from? What, what has gotten you to this point? What has led to this moment in your life? Think of the moment, if you have one, that you began to follow Jesus. Maybe, hopefully, today is that moment for you, if it hasn't started already. Think of that moment. Now, think of the future. Think of how things may or may not play out. Think of where, where is Jesus leading you? What is the pathway that he's putting you on right now? And then go beyond that. Think of eternity and just let the hope of heaven wash over you this morning.